Hello, welcome to ASC Advisory Group's Educational Digital Transformations of Supply Chain Best Practices to Make It Real webinar. Digital transformation should be in every company's strategy plan, but what exactly does it mean? What factors make it a success for operational backbones of companies? What are some of the traps along the way? How to make it sustainable? Over the next 40 to 45 minutes, we'll be addressing these types of questions and more with the guidance from three senior executives who are very passionate about this topic. We also offer you the opportunity to raise questions as part of our interactive Q&A. We're all honored today to have Steve Banker, PhD, from ARC Advisory Group moderate today's session along with guests Nell Durak of Savoyo and Harsh Kapula of CGN Global. Nell Durak is Savoyo's COO and Head of Customer Success. Savoyo is an automated decision-making platform for digital supply chains. Nell offers over two decades of experience working in corporate America for companies such as GE and Aon before she joined the supply chain technology universe. As a Six Sigma certified manager, Nell has deep expertise in project management and process improvement and is best known for getting things done. Harsh Kapula has over 30 years of experience in managing multiple global manufacturing businesses and creating new high growth businesses. Harsh is the CEO of CGN Global, a worldwide business transformation company and one that has been selected by Forbes as one of America's best management companies for 2019. This is CGN's Global's third year in a row. Congratulations. CGN Global is a worldwide implementation and client transformation partner to Savoyo. Harsh and his team have extensive experience driving business and digital transformation across clients, businesses, and certainly in supply chain. Harsh has an MBA in operations management and MS industrial engineering from the University of Cincinnati, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Steve Banker, Vice President of Supply Chain Management of ERC Advisory Group. Steve heads up the supply chain and logistics consultant team. Steve is well known, authoring many market research and strategy reports, serves as a frequent speaker, widely quoted in trade publications covering logistics, material handling, and supply chain management, as well as manages many consulting projects for manufacturers, retailers, software providers, and venture capital firms. Steve's technology area of focus includes autonomous robots, transportation management, managed transportation services, 3PL services, warehouse management, and supply chain planning as examples. Steve is weekly featured columnist for Forbes.com and Logistics Viewpoints. In recognition of his contributions to the supply chain and logistics field, Steve was selected as a pro to know by Supply and Demand Chain Executive Magazine. Steve holds an MBA from Babson College and a PhD from Indiana University. We hope you enjoy the webinar and please take part in the interactive Q&A. If you have any questions after the session is over, we will leave you with the email addresses of each guest. You're welcome to contact each one directly. If you'd like to have a continuation of this topic and discussion, please let us know by simply emailing one of our guests. I'll now turn it over to Steve Banker. Steve will walk through today's agenda and moderate today's webinar. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, well, thank you, Conrad. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is the agenda. Uh, I think Conrad introduced it pretty well. We're gonna be talking about these topics, but not necessarily in this order. So, uh, Neil, maybe you could advance the slide, please. So, uh, ARC's been actively researching um, uh, digitization for some time. We've got a, a digital transformation user council that, that drives our ongoing uh, research. Uh, we've done a, a lot of writing and thinking around this. Um, and I think the, the biggest thing to realize is uh, that digital transformation is bigger than just supply chain management. It's bigger than technology. Um, we need to realize that there are specific strategies and people issues and ways to approach outcomes that are different than other improve, improvement programs that companies can undertake. Um, so with that, let's um, take a partial list of digital technologies that, that we're tracking. And we'll probably circle back to this at the end. But for now, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to hand it over to Neil. And Neil, perhaps you could give us your perspective on a digital, what digital transformation means. Sure, thanks Steve. Hi everyone. Uh, one of the best definition of uh, digital transformation that I came across that really resonated with me 
uh, is what actually Jeffrey Moore uh, defined recently. He basically says that digital transformation is not like going to an expensive restaurant where ask for the menu, you select an order from a, a list of uh, fancy technologies, and you, you know, you're uh, hoping for that to be delivered by a very highly trained chef. And then, you know, you enjoy it, you pay the bill, and then you go home happy. Uh, to the contrast, digital transformation is like going to the gym. Well, you, <laughs> it takes uh, a bit of a sweat. And uh, it also takes time to get in shape, right? And you may need help from a uh, personal trainer to show you the way. Uh, but ultimately, you know, even though it might be an initial pain, you build out the right muscle over time. And through repetition, you get in shape uh, and, and enjoy this newfound energy uh, to, to do and feel better. So I think, you know, this uh, is uh, what I think can be the base for how we can define it. And then if you were to go into some stats, um, you know, clearly everyone thinks digital transformation is important. It cuts through, cuts through all industries, and no industry is immune to digital disruption. And it's a worldwide phenomenon, right? You see it in not only uh, mature markets, but you also see it in emerging markets. Now, when, it's, when it comes to uh, specifically supply chain uh, uh, digital transformation, you know, you see uh, many companies really view it as a very critical area. And, uh, and, and it's, so, it's no uh, uh, um, you know, surprises for obvious, reason, obvious reasons. You cannot even drive any kind of a customer experience transformation without operational excellence in the back end. And what's also important about this is that you know, any meaningful improvement you make in the supply chain pays off in a big way. We're talking about, you know, uh, about 3% EBITDA improvement. Uh, EBITDA growth, which is uh, quite significant. But what's also interesting is that despite all this, there is about 70% failure rate. And then when you take it to, you know, some of the specific industries like retail, where you would think that they are the most susceptible to digital disruption, we're talking about only 3% of these digital transformation projects yielding real results. So, um, you know, with that, you know, forget about the failure when we just want to talk or focus on success and what are sort of the pillars of success? You know, as a supply chain planning platform, we at Solvoyo learned as we did projects, you know, in different markets or across the globe. And from these projects, we actually kind of distilled these pillars into five areas. You know, the, the first area is agility. You know, as the demand changes and the business reality on the ground changes, uh, can you make the, uh, the, do you have the agility to, to adapt? For instance, you know, can you quickly reconcile demand and supply in response to, in response to a change in the business, like, you know, production line going down or a vendor problem? Or in, uh, you know, we even uh, ex explained this in a recent uh, uh, digital supply chain vision video. Can you actually uh, um, uh, adapt in such a way that if the platform detects much higher than normal social media or search activity, right, on the web, can you quickly trigger replenishment orders or open up a new shift for extra production? So that kind of wraps up the agility piece. When it comes to insights, I mean, clearly digital transformation requires a lot of data to be collected, right? When you collect this data, great, but if can you convert this wealth of data into insights and then take those insights and convert them into actions. Because I think, you know, our philosophy, our, our actual premise is, is that if you don't convert any of this insights into action, you just become a philosopher. <laughs> and I think example is, is when you don't convert, is assume that you detected a, uh, you, know, um, you know, from data that you're behind budget, for example, that month. Can you convert that information into action that would kind of like close the gap on, on that budget, are you going to be able to kind of like have, uh, you know, potential actions driven by an engine that will tell you, you know, how you can actually maximize revenue or maximize, mar mar maximize margin for that particular month. So this is the type of insight conversion that we are talking about. And it's the same thing is true for predictive models. Can you actually uh, detect 
out of stocks, excess stocks, and really takes, take uh, purchasing actions immediately. Another area that's extremely critical is this workforce productivity. Now, how do you really empower your workforce to make smarter decisions faster and do things that require natural intelligence only, not artificial? So what the premise here is that leave the machines to do the artificial intelligence and uh, you know that's where automated decision making comes into play. And then can you actually uh, do so much more with less, but really re uh, re uh, rely on your uh, people's uh, creativity and intelligence for things where it matters. Now, when it comes to uh, transformation, uh, you know, if you are not transforming, if you're not challenging existing processes, right, this is a very important aspect of digital transformation that you see, you come across quite a bit. That also, like, if you don't really do this one right, it really leads to majority of the of the failure examples. You know, most likely a company's existing processes are not suitable to doing business in the digital world, right? And we experience this all the time. They want digital transformation, but they're not ready to put their data on the cloud. Um, and, 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 you know, when you make sure that uh, uh, when you're ready for the transformation bit, that you also get the organization ready to digest that kind of a bit of a leapfrog, leapfrog uh, approach. Now, going back to uh, the, um, the, the pillars, the last bit is probably the most important bit. Whatever you do in digital transformation, has to drive results. And we are talking about really meaningful, measurable KPI improvements that not only happens once, but actually drives continuous improvement in the organization by you know, continuously tracking it. And if there's a shortcoming, you diagnose it quickly and identify ways to uh, improve. And, and I think you know, uh, making sure that none of this is really done for the sake of doing some sexy stuff. Now. I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, before I uh, pass it on to Marsh, from Harsh, uh, I just reiterate what's important. If you are digitizing to help your organization to make smarter and faster decisions using technology, you also need to accelerate change management. And, and the reason we chose CGN as our implementation partner is in addition to being supply chain experts, they are focused on uh, transformation and they're very much of out, 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 uh, come focus and I think you know it will be very important to kind of hear Harsh's uh, uh, point on this just kind of <laughs> follow the loop. Harsh? Thank you Neil <clears throat> and, and welcome to all of you thank you for taking the time to join us today for a conversation about digital transformation of supply chains you know uh, some sound bites sometimes are helpful you know, if you look at it from the perspective of uh, somebody you think of digital transformation is Jeff Bezos. You know, he says that there's an era, era of volatility and there is no other way to succeed than to keep reinventing because everything that you do, somebody is going to copy. So you need to be actually leading with change and innovation. Otherwise, you, you know, you'll have people who will catch up with you. Now, the other issue uh, from somebody who is the chairman of the XPRIZE, uh, Peter Diamandis, says that companies have too many experts who block innovation. Why? Because habits are embedded and that muscle memory is hard to lose and that is something that has to be overcome through this process of change management and transformation. At the end of the day, it is what is it that you're looking for is the question. And the quote there says that, you know, people don't really want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. Very important idea. If you go to the next slide. Neil? No? So, uh, so then what does it mean what a digital transformation of supply chains is all about? At the first instance, Neil spoke about, spoke about it very clearly. And it is about transforming the enterprise to operate at the speed that business must run at. The faster the supply chain, <clears throat> the more processes that must fall out and reduce cost. If it doesn't accomplish that, you're not going to get a fundamental change in your supply chain. Uh, you cannot stay with the kind of processes that you've always had. But the other 
aspect of digital transformation is that it is about adapting to changing customer expectations but in fact as people like Amazon and others have done is to create new ones new customer experiences that they have not thought about didn't know that they needed but when they saw it they say wow this makes my life better and so digital transformation must at its core change the customer experience uh, because the more they are involved uh, the more that they feel that they are in control the other area which is really really important is driving differentiation at the end of the day you know if uh, five companies in a competitive set have a supply chain that is run let's say on SAP or whatever the enterprise platform is you know it drives a certain amount of sameness that is not the objective they are necessary processes but at the end of the day the innovation is in driving differentiation between your supply chain and what everybody else does in your competitive set and in fact in this set of people who are likely to come in and be disruptors to your business that's really an important uh, factor so differentiation is a key factor another one is this, the idea of resilience you know the world that we live in uh, inevitably there are going to be changes in market conditions and disruptions in the environment how quickly does your supply chain bounce back if you haven't thought about it and haven't designed the network and the information flow to allow you to do that it is not going to be the supply chain that you want and maybe uh, the final aspect is what we call a highly collaborative ecosystem very often companies tend to think about their operations our belief very fundamentally is that in the area of transformation if you are not bringing along your supply base and if you're not bringing along your channel partners to the ultimate customer and knit that together very tightly that is where you create a massive amount of uh, disruption that's where you create a lot of it allows for a massive amount of innovation and we believe very strongly that a highly net, uh, close-knit network across the collaborative ecosystem is what drives differentiation in the marketplace and really gives you sustainable advantage uh, but it's also about uh, rethinking how business is done and about changing processes all the time so those are some key things that we think about in terms of digital transformation of supply chains um, and with that I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Steve uh, thank you very much um, I think Neil and, and Harsh you've, you've done an excellent job one of the things we probably haven't talked as much about uh, are the technology uh, uh, newer emerging technologies that are getting getting a lot of attention uh, I think my personal um, opinion is that when it comes to supply chain planning uh, and supply chain management it's it's artificial um, intelligent intelligence and machine learning um, that have, have become really really hot and and in my opinion impactful um, Neil maybe we'll start with you and perhaps you could give us uh, your impression of the role of machine learning and supply chain planning um. Right. Um, thanks, Steve. I think I'll first start with kind of big data analytics because data is the foundation of everything. And, you know, when you think about that, all these technologies are interrelated simply because all these technologies require data and lots of it. And, you know, we're not talking about not just the internal data, like, you know, like the customer transactions, but also uh, data, internal data married with external data. And the external data can include anything from, uh, you know, competitor data, uh, pricing data, weather data, social media data, that kind of provides the basis for versatile predictive modeling, which is basically the foundation behind machine learning. And when you see kind of like, you know, uh, Internet of Things and sensors coming into the picture, is that they also feed real-time data into the supply chain, so that they improve the accuracy of ultimate decision making so when you think about this and the machine learning finally in the predictive um, uh, uh, sense what happens is that it uh, the machines learn from kind of the hits and misses uh, by collecting this data digesting it processing it and learning from it in a continuous loop and adjusting itself accordingly right so this is kind of like everything in a 
united universe. And I want to just take demand planning as an example, right? So typically, uh, you do in a uh, demand planning, you typically take historical data and use that as a base for forecasting. But in the digital supply chain universe, now lots of external data is made available to us in a large scale, right? So what do you do is that what you take, for example, e-commerce clients, you process Google Analytics data, web searches, click-throughs, uh, that kind of define the basis of uh, uh, some of those demand drivers, right? And, uh, you know, another example that uh, uh, for demand uh, uh, planning that we do these days is how we process images for promotional materials. And we match those to our clients and our competitors' products, and we create like a price elasticity index. Here's a perfect example of an IoT, for example, that allows us to be make better decisions, right? For fashion clients, actually, we, we process these images to automatically create product attributes. These things were never available even up until like a year or two ago. Um, and, 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 and what happens is that, uh, you know, all of these I IoT platforms converting unstructured data into structured data for us to be able to do better forecasts. So think of a huge ecosystem, data coming in, being processed and data pushing out. And then like Harsh described, it really happens across the value chain, starting from your vendors and it pushes all the way to your customers and your customers' customers. And like one area that uh, we see uh, this machine learning algorithms, for example, come into picture is how we calculate promotion lifts to drive actions, not just for supply chain folks, but also for sales and marketing teams. So like imagine because you have this robust model fed by continuous improvements right through the adaptive learning algorithms that will actually tell you uh, what kind of promotions you should run not to lose margins, especially on products that promotions don't have much impact. So what you're doing is with this promotion effectiveness, you're not only empowering supply chain people, but also sales and marketing people. And then machine learning can help us learn about vendor behavior, you know, how timely they are. And then that leads into inventory uh, improvement, for example, right? It, because it's a, it becomes an input into our inventory optimization engine. And the whole idea is to use these technologies to close the gap between planning and execution. And the same is true for supply chain, supply planning, you know, Automate, automatic update of uh, planning parameters, for example. Typically, there is static in, in the old world, in the digital supply chain world, you can actually make them dynamic so that they automatically get updated to drive your inventory and supply decisions. And processing more inputs into the plan faster, right? Uh, not just, for example, material and line constraints, but even labor constraints you know, making SKU-based plans uh, uh, quickly. So I think this, this world is so exciting that it just feeds this whole notion of making smarter decisions faster. I think that's how I would describe it. I mean, uh, uh, Harsh, would you like to add anything else to that? Yes, uh, so Nilofer, you know, the, the stuff that Solvo is doing is truly exciting and very, very innovative. And that's why, you know, we've been uh, very happy to partner with uh, Solvoyo, but there are a couple of areas that perhaps I want to talk about. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure that a lot of people realize that in the in the whole idea of digital transformation, supply chain is actually not leading the pack, but is a little bit behind. You know, after the initial set of innovations many years ago through initiatives like quick response, total quality management, collaborative planning, forecasting and replenishment, etc. Uh, there has not been that much in the way of uh, digital transformation. There's some, but now I think that does not make sense from the perspective that supply chains drive, you know, 60, 70 percent of the cost of a business, uh, and even more when you consider some external factors from customers and so on. So it is something that has to be done, uh, and all of us who are professionals, you know, in the supply chain arena and thinking about it, we need to kind of think really deeply about how we make the transformation happen. And, and that's really one of the things that we uh, would, would help with. Uh, but in the area of uh, big data, AI and machine learning, uh, one of the things that we feel is important to allow people 
in the supply chain and they're literally the largest group of people in any enterprise that they need to have the ability to look horizontally across the data and across the information so that they can decide what kind of actions that need to be taken. Uh, you know, there's the idea of a, of a digital duplicate to kind of drive some strategic thinking, but then you get into the whole idea of predictive uh, data and all of those kinds of things that Nil spoke about. There's another idea that I'd like to chat about here a little bit. You know, the human mind is an amazing uh, machine. Uh, and machine, so machine learning, AI, and big data have to allow for what we call cognitive intelligence that harnesses that creativity of people uh, in order to drive differentiation. What do I mean? But let me give you a simple example uh, in, in human terms. Let's say you go to your refrigerator because you're hungry and you open it and you say, uh, well, let me see what is there that I can eat. And you see some tomatoes and you see some mozzarella cheese and you see some balsamic and you see some lettuce and so on. And you say, uh, if I look at that universe, you know, I could make a tomato mozzarella salad. I see some bread, maybe I can make a tomato, cucumber, and mozzarella sandwich. But cognitive intelligence kicks in when you say, I could do all of those. But you know, that's not really sounding so relevant to me. But I now know that in my pantry, I also have some dough. And if I put those two together, I know I can make a pizza and that really is gonna satisfy me today. That is cognitive intelligence. That's what people can do when they look across an enterprise and say, how do I change it to what is gonna be relevant to my customer and what is gonna be relevant to me? That's kind of an important idea. And then the other idea that I want to talk about a little bit is this idea of uh, SNU. Uh, it's something that uh, Steve has talked about quite a bit. And it's the fact that, as Nil also referred to earlier, social news, events, and weather. Uh, data has been increasingly available about all of these kinds of things, but how do you incorporate them into a model for resilience that's more critical, that's going to be much more critical going forward? Uh, you know, you've, we've all seen major economic events, global events, uh, weather events, and all of those kinds of things. If the supply chain is not ingesting that and saying, and creating strategies on how to respond when those things occur, you don't actually have to uh, act in a phenomenally superior way. You just need to be faster than any one of your competitors. Uh, you know, when uh, the tsunami happened in Japan, one company or one company alone read that social media alert and immediately bought up logistic capacity, shipping capacity uh, around that area. And they were able to move their goods before anybody else could because, you know, it was just not available. So those are the kinds of things that make a difference. And, uh, you know, those are some of my thoughts. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm listening to both of you, and I'm thinking about some of the processes we've been talking about. Well, we've been talking about uh, machine learning being um, uh, focused on demand management promotions, and, and Harsh, you mentioned the cognitive supply chain. I, I guess that would sort of be um, uh, the analytics area for making better decisions. And uh, SNU, or social news events and weather, uh, has a big impact um, on risk management. If, if we were to think in terms of, uh, of retail and consumer goods companies, uh, are these the typical processes that, that we would look to digitally transform or are there other processes? I, I, I'd love to have your thoughts on this and maybe we'll start with you, Harsh. Great, Steve. So, <clears throat> first of all, we must recognize that a digital project is not digital transformation, right? But that said, there are some really good quick wins that are possible. One big area is disrupting the age old SNOP process. Uh, market volatility and disruptions really do argue for a new approach uh, that delivers what I call no touch planning. You know, in this new world, you know, science says that in order to understand demand, and react to it, one has to be able to sample the shifts in demand at least at twice the rate of change. That's the scientific principle underlying that. So enabling the no-touch planning 
requires this advanced and robust technology supported by processes and organizational transformation, which I call change management on steroids. But that is clearly an area where you can get a substantial advantage and a substantial move on your competition because the age-old SNOP process is literally embedded in organizations and it relies on a sort of a monthly cycle, which is passe now. You know, that doesn't work in the world of volatility that we live in. Another area of quick win is really leveraging connected assets in the end-to-end supply chain. Uh, it's connected assets between factories, between suppliers and their equipment, between transportation, and in fact, in the usage of the assets at the customer. This, this is true for, you know, industrial manufacturers. There is a lot of data that's coming back from these connected assets, and there are a number of strategies that can be deployed, not only to bring advantage to your own supply chain, but to use that data to allow the customer to run their business much more productively and much more effectively. Oftentimes, they do not have the capability to do that, but it creates an opportunity for the OEM and the channel partner to create value for the end customer. So those are a couple. So Neil, do you have any uh, any thoughts on quick wins in this area? Sure. Uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, the fundamental again. That's really data. And the first area that uh, you know we see when we are involved in any of these digital transformation projects is uh, master data management. You know, what's interesting here that we never see this as kind of an isolated function of, well, you go clean your data and come back to me, and then I'm going to be ready to transform your digital supply chain or transform your supply chain. In fact, what we do it is like uh, a, 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 a very fundamental concept. We say, look, your data doesn't get, if it, your data doesn't get used, it doesn't improve as, as such, your data has to be cleaned in the context of the, uh, the uh, uh, planning function that you're going to automate. So we just say you got to start somewhere, right? And, 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 and drop these serial thinking, roll off your sleeves and, and, and start testing and learning. You, you know, and throughout this process, not only we clean and, and complete the data, but we make it internally consistent and make it available and accessible. So that is kind of the foundation to what we do. So in addition to what Har said, with respect to SNOP and the connected uh, supply chains, I'll, I'll talk about like three uh, uh, areas that these things really work very effectively. And one is what we call DDRP, demand-driven replenishment planning. And, 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 and what this is, is that it's true for both retail and, and consumer companies that you basically synchronize forecasting, inventory, purchasing or replenishment decisions on their, the same platform in a completely connected fashion. Another area where, you know, uh, we talk about producers uh, is what we call DDMRP, demand-driven uh, 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 materials resource planning, right? And, and this is synchronizing forecasting with buffer management, you know, this whole inventory target setting for materials plus production, and then you also do materials management on it. So we see a lot of uh, uh, big wins in the DDMRP area. Another area which is very contrarian is to do order fulfillment and transportation together. So concurrently optimizing these two very siloed function, functions in a typical supply chain and basically saying that, hey, you're no longer rule-based. You're going to drive some really uh, uh, you know, advanced optimization to concurrently uh, uh, look at these two functions, ultimately reducing, you know, uh, your, say, transportation costs. And then the difference between doing this in a silo can go between 5% improvements in transportation costs to 20% improvement in transportation costs. So I think, you know, these areas definitely, um, you know, show the type of outcomes that we just uh, talked about as a key pillar. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite the the audience. We've sort of uh, entered the question and answer portion of uh, of this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to to enter them now, uh, and we'll take as many as we can get. 
Uh, I've got a couple more questions I can uh, I can ask while we wait for, um, for questions from the audience. Um, you know, some of what we've been talking about, it, 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 they sound like really, really big projects. Um, you know, transforming sales and operations planning and uh, doing a demand-driven supply chain in, in, in conjunction with new materials requirements planning. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but is there is there any way to get to to quicker wins? Um, let's start with Neil this time. Sure. Oh, I love this question, Steve, because uh, you know our answer to this is that uh, you know uh, pilots or proof of concepts are long dead, uh, uh, long dead, and and long live the test and learns. So a test and learn is like going to the gym that we talked about, right? Uh, you not only uh, uh, do a proper workout, but also get advice on how you eat, how to change your lifestyle. So it's like more than paying for a, a membership at the gym. And, and the test to learn should allow you to answer some fundamental questions in your mind that at the end, if you want to really consider a project successful, that you will have, uh, you will have answered. So what are these questions? You know, you look at ease of integration, right? You look at how you model and how that model fits your business reality, how processes change and how you scale and even how you get support from your technology partner or your implementation partner. So what happens is that you learn from each one of these steps and, and, and you calibrate as a result. So it, it tests to learn in a sense never fails, right? You clean up data, you take data from external sources, you make sense, sense, out of, uh, uh, sense out of it to create continuous insight, you improve processes. Uh, and in that digital world, if you cannot prove that integration of data sources and driving the type of insights and decision-making and actions, you really do not doing transformation. You're just doing a, uh, a you know, going to a restaurant type, you know, picking a few digital sexy processes uh, or technologies and, and, and throw them into a, a pot and see how they kind of react. So we really think that the tests and learns really create those measurable results that everyone, everyone can learn from and it reduces the risk for uh, you know, a lot of these companies before they embark on something uh, uh, enterprise-wide. So that would be my few cents. Harsh? Couldn't agree with you more, Neil. The whole idea is that to the there are two things which are important to a rollout. One is that it has to drive a fast cadence. The second is that people have to be able to see new opportunity the way this is implemented. But uh, the test and learn is really what creates that crucible in which conversations happen, innovation happens, people are literally able to kind of look across their business and say, what do I change? What processes are no longer necessary? Where do I get the right kind of information that I need to make a better decision? Because oftentimes that data has been in the silo. At the end of the day, the supply chain uh, leadership has to become an effective partner to the CEO to drive transformation uh, and differentiation in the marketplace. So uh, I think the test and learn concept that you just talked about is an ideal methodology to kind of do that. Well, you know, I'd like to dive in on that a little bit. Um, you know, in the supply chain planning space, we, we've talked about pilots, um, which, you know, which can, it, with a big corporation, it could cost a million dollars or more, uh, and it could take, uh, you know, several months. Um, can you give me a sense of the speed with which you would do test and learn? And, you know, is it any cheaper than the old way of doing pilots? Just just differentiate those two things for me a little bit, if you would, please. Sure, sure. Uh, perfect question, Steve. So typically in a test and learn, what you do is that, uh, you know, you pick a scope that's meaningful enough uh, that can be replicated or scaled at the end but small enough to be able to uh, drive, you know, uh, uh, quick results. And that's typically, and when we're talking about, uh, you know, mid-sized companies to very, very large companies, typically our tests and learns take anywhere between three to six months. 
And, and depending on kind of the workflow in the scope that we pick, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's probably one or two cases where we have seen it pass six months, but it's not like months passing, maybe a month or two. And when it comes to the cost, the test and learn should actually have these agility attached to it that it actually should claim uh, uh, not millions. And we are talking about even for some of the multi-billion dollar companies, we're talking about less than half a million dollars uh, when, when it comes to uh, price tax. So quite affordable to really test the technology and, and decide what you want to do next. Beautiful. Harsh, any, any thoughts or do you think she nailed that? Harsh, uh, you might be on mute. Um, well, anyway, I do have a, a question that came in. Um, it's uh, it's a little, um, I'm having a hard time opening it all the way up, but what it says is, can you comment on the types of key skills necessary as part of driving and sustaining digital transformations? Harsh, do you uh, want to, do you want to go with that first, Harsh? What do you want to do? So we may have lost um, we we may have lost harsh here. So maybe uh, okay. I'll I'll take that. I'll take no. that. Okay. No. Um, you know the the most important tool um, that you need is what that's called the soft squishy thing between your ears. Uh, it's the mind. Uh, to be specific, it's the mindset, right? And in this case, the first thing that really requires for any project in this domain to be successful is that you need to have the digital mindset. And what does that really mean? That you need to have the mindset to change, a mindset to adapt, open to automation, open to knocking down the silos within your organization because you know most likely the reason what, why you need to do transformation is because you need to change what you already have in place, right? So knock down those uh, silos, uh, the, the different functions, and uh, you know you have to make sure that there is some common uh, key met performance uh, indicators across uh, all, all of these functions, as opposed to really uh, determining success based on one silo. So you know, high level, it's it's the uh, you know the the mindset, the mindset, and specifically with respect to the skills, what happens is so that's the top down. So the bottoms up is typically. Uh, uh, you need uh, a successful project manager whose, uh, you know, um, responsibility is to make sure that the organization, organizational energy and the time is devoted to this project because without a successful project manager, usually, you know, you lose a lot of time and you lose also some momentum. So I would say that from a skill perspective, project manager, is absolutely uh, are critical. I mean, you don't need a uh, very skilled data scientist to make this a, a success. I mean, you clearly want some analytical people to uh, analyze and validate some of these models along with your technology partner. But, you know, other than what is required to do your current job uh, uh, is, 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 you know, is not really necessary. Like you, we're not expecting you to understand machine learning algorithms. We don't expect you to understand SQL. We don't expect you to understand that database management. It's like bring your analytical brain uh, into the to, to picture, you know, to validate the models, validate the data, and and kind of like drive the type of KPI improvements. We need. So that would be my uh, few cents. Yeah, this is harsh. I don't know if there's something that I said, but it kind of kicked me out. But I'm back. Um, so I agree that you know it is about uh, making the people in the supply chain much more relevant as opposed to less so. Uh, people need to see that their roles need to morph into a higher value and the technology properly designed up front really would be able to enhance their ability to drive a better supply chain uh, that allows their company to win. But it is the ideation sessions that have to be run with people with the information and the platform that allows them to go fast to really get out from the cognitive intelligence of the people that says, you know, if we did this and we changed this process or we eliminated this process and combined it with this other thing, it would really make an amazing experience for the, the uh, customer 
one that they will notice, one that they will really love, and that's good, or that it drives that speed and resilience that we're talking about. So our whole approach and methodology here is that transformation is about bringing the technology uh, into people in a way in which it empowers them. Whether it is the no-touch planning that we talked about, which is a completely different way of looking at that releases a tremendous amount of cost and increases speed, um, to incorporating data and using that like Neil said, it doesn't take a lot of data scientists per se. In the platform, uh, or the platform, the solutions are good. The change management that comes in behind it is, I couldn't ex you know, tell you how important that we believe it is, and we've seen that in action and driven a lot of transformations. Thank you very much, Harsh. I, I've got another question for, from the audience, and this is probably uh, for you, and the question is, do you have implementation experience at global firms' uh, supply chains? What is the challenge when compared to one country implementations? And uh, I'll just say, first of all, um, CGN Global is, is very respected uh, around uh, these kinds of implementations. But, um, you know, so I'll do a little bragging on Harsh's behalf. But Harsh, maybe uh, you could talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Steve. So the uh, whole idea of transformation, which is it's actually overused expression, but you know we have uh, done a, a lot of them in multinational companies in different industries. Uh, and so you have to know what you're driving. You know what we do, for example, in consumer packaged goods has to be different from what we do in consumer prepared foods that have to be delivered you know, in a half an hour. So those are some fundamental differences that we look at. So we work from the output backwards and then work with the teams that we go in. Now a multi-country implementation uh, is really taking a change management methodology that we have very successfully used in multiple organizations and then adapting it to individual locations but understanding the overall network because it, a multi-country uh, operation has connectivity between countries and, and the overall global enterprise. And we can't lose sight of it because at the end of the day, as we said, if you, you have to recognize that it is a seamless ecosystem and we need to be able to leverage all parts of it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the next uh, question, I think uh, I, it resonates with me a little bit. You know, I think I mentioned that uh, we have a digital transformation uh, uh, user council. And um, one of the things we've noticed is that, um, you know, there's so much to do around digital transformations. And you can have projects that, that start with real enthusiasm, um, particularly about using the latest, greatest technology. But how do you actually make sure these projects uh, have an impact on customers or on the bottom line? Should I take that? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, I put up the cartoon perfectly for this because it first takes leadership. Okay. Um, and when you when you uh, think about that, um, it's a combination of a top down and a bottoms up leadership. And, uh, you know, the top down is fast and efficient, uh, can be difficult, and it has a high risk of sustainability. But depending on the company culture, it might work faster than, you know, uh, more of a bottoms up uh, approach. I mean, bottoms up might be slow and painful, but there is lower risk of sustainability. So uh, I think the, there is no kind of like one answer. It's kind of a balanced um, uh, approach. You know, some companies may take the 80-20 uh, top down to bottoms up. Some some is much more democratic, 50-50, but it's definitely a combination of the two. And I think um, another interesting aspect, which also speaks to uh, some of the um, comments that Harsh made in the previous question, like how do you really ensure, say, a global rollout, and then you also need to consider the countries and the regions, right? So what we have seen that works is that in addition to the global goals of transformation, that getting the buy-in 
and the inputs from different regions and, and amalgamating into a final transformation agenda becomes extremely critical. So it's, it's, it's all this stakeholder management and making sure that uh, everybody has a say uh, in the, uh, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna satisfy everybody, right? But you, call, you seek that input to make sure that once you standardize data across a single platform, when you standardize processes, that you actually consider these different ways of doing business in, in uh, different countries. Uh, Harsh, do you want to add more? Sure. The, the idea of, of consolidating data across multiple legacy systems, you know, every enterprise that we go to, there are a host of systems. And if you're not able to, you know, pull and federate that data in a place where people can then look across the enterprise, they don't make smart decisions. Uh, and in the area of supply chain, what one has to recognize is that it has the largest number of people in an enterprise. And each one of them is making decisions all the time, every day. If you are not designing the network, the system, the data, in a way in which first they can look across and then know what kinds of decisions that they should make that drives differentiation, uh, you've not done a good job. Now, a couple of other things also have to happen. As Neil said, uh, it's certainly in today, in tomorrow's work, the solutioning was sort of left to a CIO, a CDO, or that kind of a role. Now, enter the CEO. The supply chain organization, as I said before, has to work with the CEO and has to have a vision that comprehends what must be different for the company in order to win in its marketplace. But it also requires, and this is one of the things that we drive, is the fact that the way metrics were used in supply chain across different aspects of the supply chain and indeed the rest of the organization, connecting to marketing and forecasting and all these kinds of things, uh, used a set of metrics that are no longer valid in the era of digital transformation. So you have to align the metrics in a new way that allows for that transformation to happen. Uh, and, and people will resonate with that if they understand why it is being done and what the outcome is that they are looking for. It has to really bring people into the equation. There's a tendency to think that machine learning means that the machine can do everything. It can do a lot of things, but we have to allow for human innovation to take place as well. And that is where the change management and the rollout becomes very key. Well, Neil Harsh, fabulous, fabulous insights. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we're coming up uh, pretty close to an hour here, so let's uh, let's get ready to wrap it up. If there are any further questions, um, perhaps you could direct them at Neil or, or Harsh. Uh, Neil, you wanna give your email uh, real quick? Oh, sure, nilifer.durak at uh, solvoyo.com. Okay. Yeah, do we have a screenshot for that? That would be great. Uh, I'm gonna look it up right now. Okay. And and Harsh, uh, your your email in case there's any uh, other questions. Sure. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Happy to help. My email address is harsh h a r s h dot kapula k o p p u l a at c g n global dot com. Okay. There we have them right there. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. This is uh, this has been very educational, uh, and thank you for all the attendees uh, taking uh, an hour out of your busy day to listen into this. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, everyone.